I bring grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Worthiness or unworthiness. I don't know if you've thought about that word any as we've been kind of going through worship today, but uh, you've heard the word already. You heard it in the reading of the gospel twice. What does it mean to be worthy or unworthy when it comes to our walk in Christ? The bottom line is this, that there are so many times in life when we feel unworthy, and that's a natural thing for us. You know, we are in a certain predicament or circumstance where we just say, I'm not worthy to be here. What a privilege it is, you know. Just a week and a half ago, as a matter of fact, I was in St. Louis, and the eighth grade class that graduated from, well, Noah's old school had asked me to come and be the class speaker. And the reason that I felt unworthy was because this was my oldest son, Caleb's class. If you remember, I've had two sons that are with the Lord now. And Caleb was honestly in third grade when he was taken to eternity with our Lord. And these kids remember that, surely. That's quite an impression when one of your classmates is all of a sudden lifted up and gone. And they're trying to understand because... You know, if you remember your youth years and teenage years and all, we considered ourselves immortal, right? And yet, the reality hit them front and center. And so, it was a privilege to be there with them. And I remember my last recollection of being with them as a unit was in their fourth grade year when they asked me to come and we combined all the classes. And we talked and we just shared stories about Caleb and they were on it. They were ministering to me and they were telling me all of their memories and the good things that they recalled about their friend. And it was such an uplifting thing, and yes, I did learn things about him I didn't know that parents probably shouldn't know at times, right? But it was such a great occasion, and then I go there, and I'm speaking to the class or getting ready to, and and one of the things that some of the kids had done was they'd snuck onto the property in the dark of night and took sidewalk chalk, and they wrote all of their names, their graduating class, on the sidewalk. And then Caleb's name was there, too, with a big heart. And I was like, wow, they remember Caleb. And then they get up, and this is a frequent tradition in eighth grade graduations where they'll do a history. They'll talk about their years, their kindergarten, their first grade, second grade, and they tell a story about each and every year. And when they got to third grade, all they talked about was Caleb. Wow. What a place to be and how unworthy I stood to be standing there in front of them when they were ministering to me. It was like they'd asked me to come there again so that they could, well, share their love with me. As a matter of fact, the Charles girls, are uh, Jess and Abby, and they're twins, and they're always full of hugs. They've always, for through the years, they just see me and give me a hug, trying to make me feel better. And what'd they do the minute they saw me walk in the door? Gave me a hug. They're, I just didn't feel worthy to be there. And what a privilege it was then to share with them well, the relationship that we had with one another and perhaps some words of advice as they went forward in life. Well, then I came back from that experience to be here on Memorial Day. And on Memorial Day, many of you may have been here, but there's a big recognition here that involves church and community. Some five or 600 people fill this place up, a, a, a community band, a, a choir, a gathering of veterans. And I don't feel worthy to stand in front of so many people who have served our country. Offer prayers, yes, I'll pray with anybody, but on a day like this, I didn't need to be up front. I needed to be out saying thank you. And I say that to any of you who have served in the armed forces because it's because of this sacrifices that are made, and especially on Memorial Day as we remember those who have fallen in service to this country. Well, it's because of that we have the freedom to be doing what we're doing right now, worshiping our Lord openly and freely. Worthiness. You know, when I talk about being unworthy, I talk about it as a feeling, right? Because you feel unworthy. But then there is this reality that there are times when we are postured to be unworthy. We really are unworthy. And that time specifically is when we stand before the face of God. 
in the midst of God, we are not worthy on our own accord to be even front and center. We're not worthy on our own accord to even have the privilege of prayer. We're not worthy on our own accord to call ourselves children of God. The fact that we are unworthy expresses so clearly God's grace. Because in His Son, Jesus Christ, the blood that was poured to wash over our sins, the forgiveness given to us in His name, and the righteousness that we wear, we literally talk in terms of wearing the cloak of righteousness, and maybe an alb is that because there's a center underneath, but the white reminds us that we're all made clean in Jesus. And it's in Him that we are made worthy. We truly are worthy to be front and center with God, not on our own accord, but because of what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus. Not what we've done, but what God has done for us. And so, as we reflect on that unworthiness and worthiness tension, it's a tension we live in, we see it in and out through the days of our lives. You know, in the readings that you heard today, I just want to unpack all three of them, the first two a little bit. But the, King, the first King's reading was actually Solomon's dedication prayer. King Solomon was privileged to be the one that God said, build the temple for me. And so Solomon did, and there was a dedication prayer, and it's really long. That's why there are selected verses. But if you didn't hear it, I, I want you to perhaps read it again, and you will see where Solomon was actually praying for the Gentiles, that they might be heard by God and fear the Lord just as the people of Israel did. And so what a neat thing that Solomon, a man that has this unknown wisdom that God had poured out upon him, is praying for the Gentiles, that they too, because he knew that they too were part of God's creation and part of God's redeeming plan as well. And then in the New Testament reading, Paul's writing on the other hand to, well, the Jewish Christians, the people who are following Christ, who do know God, and they're corrupting the teaching. And Paul says, don't do that. And here's what they were doing. The church in Galatia was saying this, it's great that Christ died for us, but you still need to do the works of merit in order to earn your righteousness on your own. That's what they were doing. The Jewish leaders were saying, you've got to continue to follow the customs of our traditions in order to be worthy to call, be called children of God. Remember what I said when I began this? It's not what we do, it's what God has done for us. And Paul was correcting that error. Now we see both errors in the, well not both errors, I guess one is actually the right way and the other is an error, but we see both of these expressed in the gospel reading for today with this centurion. Talked about the centurion uh, not long ago, how it's a person with position. He's a Roman kind of commander over troops of 80 to 120 people. And a centurion is typically somebody who is in that, well, obviously they're Gentile, they're Roman soldiers, but they're typically somebody that we see in Scripture time and time again that really is not concerned about the Jewish people. And that's what is unique about this one, because he loved the Jewish people. He loved them enough that he built their synagogue for them. And he embraced them, and he was friends, obviously, with the elders of the synagogue. And what we know from ancient historians is that even though centurions may have been committed to, well, Caesar and to the Roman rule, but they were usually men of good leadership skill and impeccable character. They actually treated people justly, and so it's not perhaps uncommon that he would be friendly with the Jews, but to actually be a friend of the Jews is very unique. And so this centurion also expressed his character when one of his servants became ill, ill to the point of death. And so he sent a little delegation of elders from the synagogue to go find Jesus and ask Jesus to come and bring healing upon him. And that's kind of cool because, you know, he knew something was going on here. I don't know that he knew Jesus was the Messiah, the one sent to redeem all people. But he definitely knew that Jesus had the power to bring healing. He was from God. And he asked Jesus to come forth. And as he was doing so, Jesus then was entering Capernaum. 
Well, then um, uh, the man, the centurion, sent another little delegation of his friends that said, please don't bother coming into my house. I am not worthy. I'm not worthy to have you in my home. Just say it, and it will be so. What humility. And Jesus responded to that then with a statement that said, not even in Israel is there one with faith such as this. Wow. Wow. So we see a Gentile that's expressing what we might call authentic faith. See, what you didn't hear was the Jewish leaders, what they were telling Jesus was, hey, you need to come and heal this guy's servant because he is worthy. That was the first time you heard the worthy. He is worthy for all the things that he has done for us. And see, it wasn't the centurion stuff that he did that made him worthy. It was simply God's grace and Jesus Christ coming forth into his midst that was going to bring healing. And so when the centurion reflected on that and sent this second delegation, it expressed his true character. His faith was in Jesus to bring healing to his friend. And so Jesus' response was, well, fitting, not even in Israel. Because these people were continuing to struggle with what they did to earn their own merit before God. We in our lives have this struggle as well. I know just a few weeks ago I stood here and I talked to you about how even I as a pastor, I, all of us do, we struggle with that. We need an attaboy. We need you know, to hear words of affirmation. And it's a good thing to affirm others. Affirmation exercises are good. And it's good to uplift one another. But then there are those times when we stick our chest out a little too prideful and say, ooh, look at what I've done. And you know, honestly, when I get to heaven, I want to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. A life lived in glory to God is a life well spent. But it's not about us. It's about God. So we can release this struggle of needing to be perhaps earning our own merit before God. As a matter of fact, I encourage you to read Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, but it tells us very clearly, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's by the grace of God. We need to remember that it's not what we have done to get us to heaven, but it is what God has done for us. Plain and simple. We are unworthy on our own, but we are worthy because of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, we can stand before God openly and freely. It's what the freedom of the gospel is about, being able to come to God freely in prayer, to ask for him to intercede on things that are going on in our lives, to help others, just as the centurion did. And God answers those prayers. He doesn't always answer them the way that we want, but he always answers them. And the funny thing is, even when he answers prayers in a way that perhaps we don't want, you can see God's hand at work in it so clearly. I know when we moved here, we prayed that God would help Gretchen find a job quickly and our house in St. Louis would sell quickly. Neither one happened. And so we're like, okay, God, we're waiting and we're about to go to the poor farm, so what's going on here? Okay, God, not trusting you so much right now. And it's amazing how he answered the prayer. Gretchen got a job in February, months later than we wanted, but she got a good job. And our house, well, it didn't sell. We, we had some people contact us and say, we love your house. We've fallen on far, hard financial times. Would you consider renting it to us? And we said yes. It's amazing that God opened the door for ministry between us and this family. It's not always the way we call for it. And we just trust. We walk as the centurion did. And we simply trust that God can work in our lives in any in all circumstances. So, as we go forth today, let's remember, it's not about what we have done, it's about what God has done for us and continues to do, and so frequently in ways we could never imagine. And by the way, there is a place for good works for all of us as God's children. It's God who called us to be his children. Little Brandon was washed in the waters of baptism. He's a child of God. And as I said, now God's got a plan. 
God's got a plan for all of us. We do do good works. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 ends with this, that, that God has prepared good works in advance for us to do. So it's in response to God's grace in our life that we go out and we serve others and share his grace in the world. It can be do, done through things like, well, today we're taking a, a door offering for more Oklahoma. Uh, we're going to hopefully send teams out there to help clean up after the tornadoes. We do these things in response to God's grace in our lives and in order to share his grace with others. So go forth, my friends, and know that God is at work in you. And it's because of what he's done in Jesus Christ that you are worthy to be called a child of God. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.